our goal today is to talk a little bit about um, some of the, the trends and mandates in uh, Iran research funders that are reflecting um, some of the, the practices in open science that uh, the center here are big fans of and uh, like to advocate. Um, and it's, there's a lot of activity, lots of uh, frequent changes in this uh, arena. So um, it is difficult to, to keep track of as researchers. You have a lot uh, going on within your own work. Um, keeping track of that is one more thing. Uh, so David here is gonna help us do that. Um, so in just a second, I will hand off to David and Nikki to introduce themselves, um, and then we'll launch into our material for today. David? Thanks, Eric. Uh, I'm David Meller. I'm the Director of Policy Initiatives here at the Center for Open Science, and I work on our um, initiatives to increase rewards for open science practices and work with big institutional stakeholders, such as fund private and public funding agencies on a lot of these topics. Well, thanks, David and Nikki. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nikki Pfeiffer, Director of Product here at COS. Um, obviously, working on the free tool that we have built and maintained the OSF and many of our other uh, interface tools to support communities and researchers um, and societies, funders as well um, in, their, in their goals for open practices. All right, thank you, Nikki. So just quickly, I will uh, preview what our plan is for today. Um, we've just done introductions. Um, David is gonna talk a bit about um, some of the, the funder mandates that, um, that not only is he follow and document, but in many cases is, uh, plays a real significant role in uh, the formation of those policies. Um, we'll take a moment if you have questions or as questions come in, um, you use that Q&A um, field that you have available for you in the Zoom uh, interface um, to put your questions in and we'll take a minute to answer some of those. Um, and then Nikki will sort of tell us a bit about how um, the, the USF tool uh, is built with the, this changing landscape in mind, um, and then we'll do a little quick tour um, of some of the features that uh, David will sort of preview for us. Um, so yeah, use that, that Q&A uh, field so that we can see some of those questions coming in as we go. Um, the session is recorded, so if you wanna come back and reference this later, or if you wanna send it to a friend, um, we'll, we'll send this material out to you um, later. Uh, so David, uh, are you able to Share your screen. I might need to stop first. Yeah, stop yours and there we go. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, as Eric said, I'm the uh, director of policy initiatives here at the Center for Open Science. We are a mission driven nonprofit with a focus on increasing openness, integrity, and reproducibility of scientific research. I always like to give a little introduction of who we are as an organization. If you're on this webinar, if you come across it, uh, you likely know who, you, who we are, but you know, just in case, I wanna make sure uh, to give a little introduction and some context about um, our organization. We work to achieve our mission of increasing openness through basically a three part strategy. We look for um, evidence of best practices and uh, look for um, lessons in the ability to successfully replicate empirical research findings through our meta science uh, initiatives to, to replicate and evaluate research practices. We um, advocate and educate based on those lessons learned in our community, and our policy, and our incentive programs. That involves working with um, bottom up organizations seeking to build uh, consensus and communities of practice around a lot of these issues of transparency and working with some um, top-down organizations on policy change and making sure that incentives are aligned with ideals of how science should work. And then finally, our, our, our biggest focus is building tools to enable the types of practices for which we advocate. Um, so the focus of this webinar is, of course, meeting funder expectations around open science practices I'll be talking about what some of those expectations are, um, and then we'll transition to uh, to how to uh, how to take those steps in order to meet those expectations. Um, we are generously supported by our 
uh, by our supporters, by um, private and uh, federal research dollars to help support our mission. So I'd like to acknowledge them. The basis of this webinar is a resource page, uh, cos.io slash top funders. This is a resource page uh, that serves a couple of purposes. It's a resource page for funders themselves to see examples of um, what their peers and colleagues are doing in the funding research community. And it's a, a resource for the research community uh, designed as a one-stop shop to see what these expectations are for a variety of uh, funding agencies um, and private uh, uh, philanthropic foundations, what steps they are taking around these open science initiatives and, and what the, the future holds in store. So it's a curated research hub for, uh, for, for both of those sets of audiences. What I'm gonna be focusing on is meeting funder expectations for a variety of topics, sharing open data and materials. I'll also be going into a little bit of the how and why of doing that. But again, most of that is um, uh, Eric and Nikki will give some explanations about what the OSF um, is capable of there. Uh, I'll be giving a little bit of a landscape of what funders are doing at, uh, for pre-registration. I'll define that and give some um, examples of how that can be incorporated into workflows. Likewise, with registered reports, a publishing format that incorporates peer review before the study results are known. And then finally, how um, funders are expecting researchers to collaborate and to openly share uh, and disseminate research findings. So uh, those are the topics I'll be covering. Let's get into it. Uh, what I want to talk about first is the, let me minimize a little part of my screen here. I don't think that affects what you're seeing. Uh, what I want to get into first is open data and research materials, show what some of those funder mandates, expectations and incentives are, and getting a little bit into the why these are important, both for a little bit of selfish reasons, how they you know, in, uh, you know, bump up the impact of one's own work, um, but also the benefits that these practices have on, um, on, on one's own workflow. Uh, so the, the first section of funder expectations around um, open data and open materials and, and other research materials is um, shown here, I would say most of the activity around open science practices in the funder community is around uh, ways to incentivize or encourage uh, or to increase expectations for data transparency. The, uh, there's a variety of either mandates for open data or um, re requirements to disclose whether or not data are available. Uh, the, the trend for all of these organizations and for the funder community at large is to work on ways to increase expectations um, and eventually in, uh, mandate that all data underlying research findings be made publicly available to the greatest extent that can be applied through um, given the, the ethical and, and practical rea realities. All of these funding agencies listed here, the National Science Foundation has strong guidelines on how to share data. Institute for Education Sciences will come up several times. They have what are known as the SEER standards, standards in excellence um, uh, in education research. Um, and those mention expectations for data transparency, reproducibility, uh, replications, and I'll, I'll mention also what they are doing for pre-registration. Arnold Ventures has a strong mandate on open data, um, as does uh, Welcome Trust on a variety of their research areas either requires or strongly encourages the sharing of, under, of data underlying empirical findings based on support that they provide for funded research. The American Heart Association is, uh, has um, strong disclosure requirements and strong expectations um, and uh, perhaps changing expectations in the future about what needs to be uh, transparently shared underlying reported results. Uh, Finally, the NIH uh, just today came out with um, stronger final policies on what their expectations are for data underlying research results um, and encourages peer reviewers to look at those data management plans so that um, they can you know, evaluate how, how appropriate and how critical and how well thought out those um, expectations are. So I'll get into a minute about the importance of data management plans, but more and more funders will be taking those into account to evaluate whether or not the work is um, appropriate for funding. And so that's a, a real critical time at which one would uh, 
want to want to make sure that the uh, expectations you're lying out early on in the research life cycle are to be as transparent as possible or, or, or to include uh, plans for data transparency later on in the research life cycle. Um, links to all of those uh, policy documents or expectations and links to everything that I'm going to be talking about today are available at that data resource hub, cos.io slash top funders. Um, a, a little bit more of the reasons why um, open data uh, in particular is important is there have been several uh, documented pieces of evidence showing a citation advantage of um, empirical research findings that include links to openly available data relative to empirical findings that do not have links to underlying research data. So there's a couple of different um, studies here that saw a, a relative citation bump of you know, between one and 1.6 um, uh, or a two or three times um, in some cases um, mean improvement in citation bump for studies that are, have data available versus comparable articles that do not. Um, it's not only those two studies, but we know of uh, several more that are starting to see associations between in increasing uh, citations for an article. There are probably a lot of possible reasons why this is um, true. Uh, some of the journals, of course, that get um, relatively high citation impacts have good policies for data linking and data sharing. Uh, it's also uh, one of the explanations that seems quite plausible to me is that it's simply a more uh, usable empirical finding. If uh, data are available, it's easier to include in a meta-analysis, for example, if all of those statistics can be verified um, or calculated new if they weren't included in the original paper um, and put into that meta-analysis. So there are a lot of potential reasons why, um, but the um, early evidence is uh, tells a fairly consistent story that there are citation bumps when those open data are available. Uh, sort of a, a you know, purely logistical and workflow reason why open data is helpful is simply the, the, the management that comes into the skills required to prepare data for, uh, for, for later sharing and, and reuse are the same skills that help internal just reusing with yourself, with your future self, of course. Um, or with collaborators in your research lab. Uh, you know, this is not my uh, background or this is not my, my desktop, uh, but sometimes it, it feels like it is. Um, but we've all sort of been in that situation, I think, where it can be quite overwhelming dealing with multiple streams. Um, and, and an improvement on that is the expectation early on in a project that the um, workflow that one is going through and the data that one is collecting is, is going to be um, checked under the hood. It's going to be you know, open for um, investigation, either through peer reviewers or through post-publication peer review. So preparing a study with that level of transparency in mind at the, at the get-go is helpful for one's own sort of internal uh, organizational expectations and incentivizes one to uh, get your ducks in a row, so to speak, and just uh, make sure things are organized enough for your own reusability and uh, for others to use. And this is a um, typical OSF project that is well organized by the authors with um, code materials and, and data um, sorted into that. One of the underlying philosophies of the OSF is to create an online collaborative space to conduct research, which becomes the same place for uh, later sharing of the research. Uh, and so, that encourages the, the type of practices that we um, want others to be able to, to take a look at through transparency. The, um, we'll get more into the how-tos of open data in a few minutes, but I just want to mention a couple of important uh, points at the beginning. Uh, as I said, the preparation for data sharing is um, uh, begins a lot of these issues early on. You're, uh, sorry, there's a, might be a Q&A coming through. Hold on one second. Eric, I'll trust you if, if you, you're managing the Q&A. If there's anything that needs clarification at this point, go ahead and interrupt me. If it's something that um, can wait till the transition, we'll put it in yeah. the queue. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, 
inclusion of a data management plan, preparation for file management and version control and inclusion of licenses for reuse. Um, I won't go into too much detail about these, but just mention that they, these things are available. Um, one thing that I encourage folks to look at are these practical tips for ethical data sharing um, with a couple of clear do's and do nots. So uh, a couple of statements that we see in um, ethical consent forms or IRB um, informed consent documents is kind of a legacy that we've come across uh, promises to destroy data after a certain period of time. We want to um, try to remove as many of those as possible. Promises not to share, promise that research analyses will be limited to a certain topic. Um, a lot of these are, are holdovers from earlier times when expectations for transparency uh, weren't so keen and, the, the, and it was thought that only um, uh, limiting any data that was collected was the most ethical way to proceed. But we know through surveys uh, that um, research participants are, are generally um, quite encouraging of data sharing. They expect that to be used to the widest extent possible as long as their um, personal information, identifying information is, is remain confidential. Um, and this, these types of statements, of course, you know, limit the applicability of the, the time and effort that research participants are providing. Again, if, if, if you do end up promising not to do these things, you should keep your promises. Uh, I don't want anybody to encourage anybody to lie to say that you won't share the data and then go ahead and share it. That's, of course, not what we want to do. Um, but just to shift expectations for transparency in the future and put that in the truly informed consent category. Do, again, get informed consent to share that informed consent really uh, um, is, is a deep phrase that um, emphasizes the, the importance that the research participants should have on truly understanding what they're um, consenting to and what the implications of that are. Um, incorporate plans to share and to reuse um, both in these informed consent and in the IRB protocols and be con thoughtful of considering um, risk of, of potential re-identification. Of course, if you share lots and lots of demographic data that can often pinpoint down to individuals. Um, and so um, be aware of those limitations. We have examples of informed consent and IRB language that have been used successfully to, to share and trans, uh, transparently share research results findings. So take a look at some of those that are available. Um, a link to that is um, at the bottom of the screen and these slides and materials will be made available after the webinar as well. Include in your data management plan how data sets will be um, named and referenced, which file formats will be used, who will have access um, and how and when they'll be shared um, and how data sets will be um, preserved. So these types of standards to include in data management plans are the types of things that reviewers are increasingly expecting to see um, and, and, and not including this type of information um, will increasingly be sort of detrimental to one's funding applications. There are more resources available for both of these at the DMP data management plan tool.org um, and on our help docs. I'm not going to go uh, too much more in, into this, except uh, show some examples of well-named uh, uh, files and figures, and there'll be more information about data um, uh, data sharing and, and, and file uploads on the OSF in a few minutes. But I just wanted to give some examples of um, well-organized file name organization formats. Um, and a couple of key things to remember are the use of one directory for one project separate raw and derived data, um, separate the code from the data. And these readme files are of course good instructions to describe what to do to, to open and analyze the data. Finally, I encourage um, open licensing for, for reuse, CC0 public domain for unlimited uh, remix and reuse or CC BY again is a very open license to encourage others to, to um, use the data sets that are being shared. This just sets expectations early on for how data can be used um, and it's perfectly um, appropriate to do so. Uh, and be careful about putting more restrictive licenses on collected data because it could very well um, conflict with uh, what some expectations are from, from funders. Next topic is pre-registration. 
uh, just to define it a little bit and then to point to a couple of uh, what some funders are doing to incentivize or um, increase expectations around pre-registration. But it's the act of specifying in advance how data will be collected and analyzed for a study, submitting that plan to a study registry, either to make it public uh, available or public after an embargo period. It helps to open the file drawer so that uh, more understanding can be gained or a better understanding can be gained of how much research is conducted every year, regardless of how many results eventually become published. Um, and critically, it makes a clear distinction between um, planned research, confirmatory hypothesis tests, and the unplanned exploratory discoveries. Both of those are critically important, but keeping them separate is, is important. The, uh, when one is in the context of, of confirmation, th this is really what we, uh, a lot of the, the basic statistics that are ubiquitous in, in many empirical findings, um, presume many of these conditions are true, that this is traditional hypothesis testing. The results of this confirmation are held to high standards of rigor, and we do want to minimize false positives. We want to say that there's an effect um, when, unless there is a, a certain amount of confidence in it. And uh, again, those p-values, a lot of our traditional statistics are based on really uh, presume this type of context. In comparison to when one is in the discovery mode, looking for unexpected trends, you really want to minimize false negatives in this case. The uh, most common examples, of course, uh, uh, discovery of antibiotics. It was purely uh, uh, you know, an unplanned discovery, seeing how um, that affected growth rates. And you obviously don't want to miss those unexpected negatives. You don't want to say that nothing's going on um, and, and, and miss out on a potentially worthwhile uh, research agenda or research question. But the, the context of, of discovery uh, really presumes that it'll be confirmed at a later point. So when reporting um, exploratory findings, um, that's an important uh, distinction to make and, and not to make inferences based on those types of discoveries. Purpose of pre-registration is often to make a clearer distinction between these two modes, not to value one over the other, um, but to provide a, a marker and a reminder for oneself a year from now, perhaps, uh, what those planned uh, analyses were, what, those, what the context was at that time, um, and to free oneself to go into purely discovery mode once the expectations of confirmation are met. They complement each other very well, but mixing between the two can be problematic. Um, it's problematic because it's in some ways incentivized to present exploratory results as if they were confirmatory. It makes it look more surprising, newsworthy, publishable, but it comes at the expense of their credibility. And so that is really what in the, the focus of registration is about. When one pre-registers, we expect that the expectations are that one should include a link to the pre-registration in any preprint or article that comes from this report the results of all the analyses that were included in that, in that pre-analysis plan. If there were 10 hypotheses and 10 analyses, um, include all 10, not just the, the one that looked most exciting. Any new analyses that were added to the work um, must be made transparently clear, ideally in, in a separate section. And whatever changes uh, occur to the methodology um, should be documented and shared. And there are examples of that. Um, on the website as well. You can take a screenshot of that or again, these slides will be made available afterwards. Many funders are taking steps to incentivize pre-registration. The National Science Foundation encourages one to link to pre-registration as a, a preliminary research output. Institute for Education Sciences, I mentioned their SEER standards before, standards for excellence in education research, um, strongly encourages the use of pre-registration Arnold Ventures incur, uh, requires it when making, um, when, when conducting inferential studies, taking a sample, making an inference to a wider population. Um, the, the Dutch research funders on MW requires it in certain contexts, as does the German Federal Ministry of Education Research. PCORI is a, a great funder of health centered research, um, created about uh, eight years ago, uh, and they do a great job of. Not just for clinical research, but for um, you know preclinical health research, requiring pre-registration, and they take an extra step, which we strongly encourage. Uh, we think of it as kind of a 
um, a level two of approach of verifying that the results were reported consistently with what was in that registration. Um, and they have a database of results that were reported um, and that are internally reviewed by PCORI staff before presenting on their website. Um, that doesn't preclude other publication. It's just a, um, a good way to clearly demonstrate what is what was planned and what was found. Finally, the National Institute of Health and NIH has been um, working for a while to determine the best uh, definitions to include for, for what should or should not be considered clinical research um, and therefore fall under mandates about what needs to be registered. And we are working with them in many regards to um, help clarify those expectations and make registration as, as easy as possible, um, no matter where it's registered. So you can see links to all of those documents and all those policies, again, at that website I've mentioned a couple of times. Register reports is uh, a step above pre-registration in that it takes that pre-proposed um, plan and subjects it to peer review. And there are many funders that are taking steps to encourage the use of registered reports in their pipeline by uh, partnering with journals to review, uh, review proposed studies. Um, and, and after that proposed plan is undergoes a, a series of a few rounds of peer review, there can be both um, funding for that proposed research and a promise to publish the results regardless of the main outcomes that are found. So these funders, Children's Tumor Foundation, the, um, the Award for Global Research on Nicotine Dependence, Cancer Research UK, the Flu Lab, and Templeton World Charity Foundation, they all um, uh, work in, with various journals to have submissions uh, that are fundable uh, if they go through that round of peer review again, before results are no. And there are examples of those initiatives and there are more in the works that will be um, coming out in the future. So we encourage researchers to prepare for this. You can, there are um, about, about 250 journals that accept rich reports at this point. So we encourage researchers to submit to those. Um, and as more funders provide the award of funding um, for a successful stage one peer review, um, those will become even more well incentivized. Richard report model is, is a two stage peer review model, as I mentioned. That first focus is really on whether or not the hypotheses are well founded. This is all taking place before data collection starts. Are the methods and proposed analyses feasible? Is the study well powered? Um, and very importantly, is there some test of fairness? Have the authors included positive controls to demonstrate that the study will be conducted to a high standard of rigor? Um, when those are only evaluated in a post hoc manner, there's all sorts of biases that occur depending on whether or not the study quote unquote worked or did not. Um, and so it's, it's best to set those fair criteria up before knowing what the results are. If, the, if after one or two or, or a few rounds of review, um, editors and reviewers agree that the answer to those questions are yes, then the uh, study can be given an in principle acceptance, a promise to publish the final results no matter how they turn out. After the study is conducted, uh, a quicker second round of review, did the authors follow the approved protocol? Did those positive quality control steps succeed? And are those conclusions that the authors are drawing, are they justified? But very importantly, uh, reviewers and editors aren't looking at whether or not the results are significant or impactful at this point. Um, those are sort of, those are unscientific uh, reasons for disseminating evidence um, and those do not come up in that uh, second stage of peer review. There's a complete uh, resource hub available for authors, for reviewers, and for editors, and for funders um, at, this, um, at this website, cos.io slash All right, wrapping up, there's just gonna be um, two more quick notes about funder expectations for uh, future collaboration. The National Science Foundation has several grant programs that specifically include um, calls for collaborative research projects. The idea being that um, teams working together will um, of course have a bigger impact uh, and that increases transparency. There are a lot of um, good anecdotes out there about uh, teams trying to replicate one each other's work. Uh, it works out several kinks that are often uh, harder to uncover if, if you don't have a, a, a team uh, working with you at the same time. Uh, and we see several uh, agencies and calls for collaborative research grants. 
and collaboration is one of the um, main benefits of the, the open science framework. It's really designed with that in mind for um, working across, across space. Finally, uh, there are increasing expectations that the results of empirical findings and funded research should be made freely available. Um, you know, a lot of these are either um, publicly funded agencies or charitable organizations that uh, want to show their donors, want to show policymakers um, what the, the outcomes of the research are um, and don't want those outcomes to be behind, uh, behind a paywall. So um, many funders are going to be behind what's well known as um, Plan S, Coalition S of funders are advocating for work that results from projects that they support financially um, should be made you know, immediately um, available for everyone. And we encourage folks to take a look at what your particular funder requires. Um, and as a complement to that philosophy, uh, you know, quickly disseminating without paywalls uh, via preprints. There are many um, preprint platforms. Uh, we encourage many to, uh, in, across several disciplines, a lot of social scientists, a lot of behavioral scientists and psychologists um, have platforms available on the, the OSF preprint service, um, as do many others. So with that, I will um, put up this, just a couple of more resources. So that's a few times, feel free to take a screenshot um, or just uh, wait for the slides to be shared afterwards so that these links will become available to you. Um, but take a look at those and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll see if there are any questions that should be answered right now or we'll transition right away. Thanks, David. So I do have a, a few here. Um, so Diane asked a couple of good questions here that probably uh, especially of interest for our funder and funder infrastructure friends that are in attendance today. Um, so two, I think I can kind of tie together. How do these, how do the funders check uh, the, that the grant recipients have complied with those promises with those uh, statements that they had included with their proposals. Um, and then, you know, related to that, if there is this data that they've, you know, assured that they're gonna, that they're going to include or share, where would be the, the version of record for that, especially if their data ends up being included in, in multiple locations? Right, that's a great question. Um, a lot of funders are taking the approach of reviewing what the, um, you know, the proposed data management plan includes. Um, so a well thought out data management plan that has a, a, again, a well laid out plan for how um, data will be collected, organized, and then preserved. Um, some are, are stopping at that stage. And of course it takes a little bit of trust at that point to say that'll be followed. Um, but it is a good signal to the funder and the reviewers that one is taking this seriously. Some are taking a little bit more active step of looking either at the interim progress reports or the final reports um, and asking for one to fill out the field of, you know, please include links of any um, research outputs, including data. Uh, some of the strongest ones are considering the, the, the biggest stick that can be included at, at any given point would be future research could be um, or future research evaluation, future research proposals um, could be affected based on one's um, following of that proposed plan. Um, that, that's, uh, there, there's a lot of active discussion about whether, uh, about how one would um, um, in, enforce that type of expectation because of course it you know, requires a fair assessment of, of whether or not one followed the plan. Um, but a demonstration in the research grant that here are past examples of me following my data management plan, or here are past examples of me pre-registering or sharing materials or code are a great signal that one's um, proposed funding will, will follow the, the promises being kept. So there's some elements of trust still in there, uh, which we don't wanna get rid of fully, but, um, but uh, you know, it, 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 it improves the potential assessment that reviewers will be looking at um, when there's, there's evidence of past actions of transparency. Thank you, David. So we have an interesting question here that um, maybe both you and I can touch on briefly. Um, so Lissa asks, uh, 
she's wondering if CUS works with large research institutions to develop more tailored solutions that are widely applicable across a, brain, a broad range of disciplines. Yeah, and I think, Eric, you'll get to that in a, in a little bit. We, we have um, uh, institutional landing pages for, that can allow all the research that's being conducted in an institution be discoverable in a single place. And that allows um, uh, you know, both uh, administration within the institution, uh, members of the public or colleagues to see what, um, you know, what data sets, for example, are being made publicly available based on the, the research that's going on in an institution. So there, there's a couple of um, branded places that in, include more specific guidance and more specific standards for institutions. Another um, example would be um, what we call OSF collections, where an individual uh, journal or society or funder would establish set standards for what needs to be shared. Um, a good example there would be the International Life Science Institute, North America, see North America has an OSF collection uh, where they expect their uh, funded researchers to provide some or all of the data or materials associated with their, um, with their research findings. Awesome, thank you, David. So I see that there are some hands raised and some other questions. I am gonna make sure we come back to that if we have some time, but I don't wanna, uh, I wanna make sure we have time to get everything in, so. Diana's giving me a great question. I like your passion. There are zero journals that really insist on data sharing. Um, uh, sometimes there's kind of a level one approach which is what we call in the top guidelines statements of whether or not data are available. And of course, saying no in that case is an acceptable statement. Yeah, you know, that's really uh, the work of peers to remind others that that's, that, that, that that's no longer acceptable. So better statements need to show up in those data availability and disclosure statements, or not just a no, but uh, here are the precise steps to um, obtain, obtain the data. Cool, thank you, David. So um, folks that, that have their hands up, just, just hang in there, um, let us continue and uh, we will try to get back around to you. And, and if that doesn't work, then uh, we'll certainly respond uh, to your questions um, after uh, the session completes today. Um, so I am gonna come back to uh, Nikki for a few minutes to tell us a little bit about how we get from all of that, uh, that activity in those funder communities to thinking about here at COS, thinking about how the OSF does, will, should work uh, to align with uh, what those community research communities really need. Great, thanks Eric and thanks David for doing that great review of, of sort of the funder landscape and, and their requests that we're starting to see trends in. Um, it, it's really great to see so many that are actively seeking these open practices among their grantees. Um, so as Eric said, we're gonna talk a little bit next about how you take it sort of from that, um, that concept of like, okay, these are things I should be doing um, or striving for um, in, my, in my research workflows into a more implementation um, stance. And so Eric's gonna do a lot of that demonstration, but as he said, I wanted to give a little background about how these, how the tools that he's gonna show you uh, kind of came to be um, and, and how that continues as part of COS's mission. Um, so OSF is sort of the backbone of this. It's a free open source tool for researchers that provides that collaborative management project space. Um, it's a lot of words thrown together, but I think you'll understand once you see it. Um, but it supports those workflows across the research life cycle. Um, and, and all of the things that, that David mentioned with um, collaborating with your teams um, across, across uh, organizations, across um, universities, um, documenting and sharing data, um, both publicly and privately. We understand that sometimes there's there's some staging that needs to happen. Um, part of that is supported on the OSF and even controlled access uh, scenarios. Um, the, the concept of pre-registration of study designs and pre-analysis plans is also part of the sort of integrated workflow of OSF. Um, 
And then finally sharing those findings um, with, with the preprints that, that David um, mentioned as well. So, so some of the things that um, we've developed obviously have been heavily done through um, collaboration with communities of researchers and funders, um, and also you know, all aligned with, with the shared goal for open practices. So some examples um, of this would be that we, one thing we're currently working through is, is working closely to bring pre-registration much closer to disciplinary researcher communities through the infrastructure that we built that enables um, customized um, pre-registration templates. Um, not to say that every researcher can come up and decide how to pre-register, but more or less we're working through um, understanding some of those challenges and gaps when you're trying to do qualitative or secondary data or longitudinal um, or preclinical and some of the some of the specific needs in that um, sense of laying out your uh, your pre registered um, plan uh, are different. And so working together with those communities and funders alike to try to come out with what is the standard or the best practice um, and implementing that on the OSF so it's available. Um, similarly, we've been working over, over a number of years to, to support more data collaboration, documenting and sharing on OSF. Um, we've done this through integrations. So we've actually implemented 11 different storage um, provider integrations and this supports all of this just by making it a little bit easier. So meeting researchers where they are in your workflow that you might use a specific storage provider for your data um, and having to move data actually starts to break down some of those really good practices David was talking about with versioning, documenting um, and keeping track of, of the historical record. Um, and so being able to attach that into the OSF where you'll see with Eric, there's, um, version control, um, there's activity logs on projects. Um, there's so many great ways that that just helps, like David said, future you um, as you move along and you don't have a mess at the end to clean up. And, and this way, um, moving data around sort of eliminates a bit of that. Um, I could go on and on of how we've collaborated. Um, this is my favorite part of the work that we do. And so it's something we're constantly doing, happy to hear um, any, you know, questions, concerns, comments on that. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. Um, but basically we collaborate to sort of understand these gaps in infrastructure and partner to bring those solutions and making these open practices um, possible, easy to implement. Um, and that also supports the funder side. So like David was talking about um, registries, collections, preprints, um, and other mechanisms to sort of enable um, more discovery into what researchers are doing and make it easy for researchers to report out as well. So with that, I'll let, uh, let Eric uh, take it away with sort of showing um, the more detailed workflows of what we've been describing. All right, thank you, Nikki. So this uh, will be a, a whirlwind tour, but uh, many of you that are here are pretty familiar with OSF already. So you're probably not gonna see things uh, for those of you that are veterans are not going to see things that are brand new, uh, but some that uh, are still orienting. Um, I think this will be helpful uh, to really connect what uh, David and Nikki have referred to, um, to uh, the, the practice of, of creating and sharing uh, material through the OSF. So today, um, just to string it all together, um, we're going to assume that uh, we had a, a grant and, and part of that grant, an NSF grant maybe, was to hold sessions like this. And we need to share our material um, from these sessions. So I'm going to create an OSF project for today's uh, webinar. So we're going to use some of the material and titles that we've already generated. Um, one of the things that we had uh, a question about was um, how this aligns with research institutions and how they um, can both sort of advocate for practices like this within their communities and also um, recognize, you know, when those communities are, are really embracing those. Um, part of that is through um, a, a suite of tools that um, is built into the OSF called OSF Institutions. And I'll sort of show you what the results of this looks like in a moment, but because I am part of uh, two of those uh, organizations that are, are members of institutions, I get to, to choose from those affiliations that are relevant. And a lot of what I decide right here as I'm setting up a project as well as 
things that I'm going to do on my project uh, shortly, I can come and modify and continue to evolve this, this project. The one thing that um, I need to make a, a decision about early uh, is where my information is going to be stored. And this is, you know, another part of uh, OSF adapting and adjusting to global research policy um, is recognizing that there are regions where data security is, um, is important and it's important everywhere, but part of their approach was to um, ensure that that data is stored uh, regionally. Um, so that is uh, something we have embraced with our Google, uh, Google Cloud Storage um, is to have storage locations in some of these regions, including Australia, Canada, Germany, and the US. Um, this you won't be able to change once you've made this decision. So one to think through uh, while you're setting up your, your project. Um, and then you get to, to start off um, by including a quick description before we launch into our project. And so all I need to get to this point, I've you know, now created a, a project on the OSF is to sign up for an OSF account. It's completely free as uh, Nikki has pointed out. Um, you know, there are lots of other things you can do on the OSF or your institution or your funders or um, publishers might do on the OSF, but your account is, is always gonna be free. Um, so we've set up our project here and right away, I know I have uh, some contributors that I need to include as part of my project. Um, so there's a couple of ways to add those quickly from the uh, interface. You can, I can see the existing contributors myself, um, but I can also add uh, Nikki and David for their contributions to our session today. They should be pretty easy to track down on the OSF. There is Nikki right there. And we'll add, uh, so one of the things that David pointed out was that um, you have lots of flexibility in terms of access control. And that's not just who you include your project, but also um, the permissions that those individuals have uh, to make changes within those projects. So I have community members that um, even for something that is gonna remain private like this project is for right this moment, um, I can give them read access. They won't be able to make modifications, but they can come and see all of our content. Um, the, the read write contributors will be able to make modifications, but they won't be able to you know, delete the project or to register it, which we'll come back to in a moment. And then administrator, which can do all of the above, uh, just like myself as a, as a creator um, can do, creator of the project. So let me add David here, make him an administrator as well. And then when we return to our front page of our project, we will see our new contributors added. There we go. Uh, and because we're all uh, affiliates of uh, COS, that we have our affiliation badge here included on our project. And quickly, I'll, I'll show you what uh, David was referring to um, for researchers that are part of one of these institutions that uh, partner with us, we have a, they have a landing page, all of those um, institutions. And I think Dickie shared the, the link uh, to those institutions. And this landing page is all of the public material, uh, the projects and the registrations that um, affiliates of uh, those institutions are working on on the OSF and we have a whole lot here on COS so this will load uh, all day so I'm not going to sit here and, and wait for that. Um, but uh, you can check out a lot of our other institutions and the work that they're doing and this project that we're working on here uh, will show up once we make it public. Um, so we added the, a description when we first um, set up our project we can come and, and modify this if we need to, um, if we need to have a real detailed breakdown of what's included in our project um, or instructions for contributors, if uh, particularly if you have lots of contributors that contribute in, in multiple ways, we have a wiki that uh, uses Markdown. So you can um, create a detailed wikis um, with lots of 
instruction. You can even embed files, images, videos uh, to help orient visitors to your project and to your material. Um, and uh, Nikki mentioned just a moment ago, um, some of our storage solutions. I'm gonna go ahead and connect one of those because I already have our slides uh, in one of our Google Drive um, folders. I can go ahead and connect that and I don't need to go and find that again because it will already be included in my project once I connect this folder successfully linked. So when we look in our uh, files tab here, we'll see all of the files that um, have been included. In this case, we have files that are in uh, two of our different storage providers here, Google Drive uh, being one, and then uh, the native OSF storage being the other. Um, so I didn't have to, to upload this file uh, anew because it was already included in my Google Drive folder. Uh, but despite that, when we look at the file um, here in OSF, it's gonna render for us. And we have many, many file types that will render um, in the OSF so that you're not having to, to bounce around and change uh, providers. Um, you also have a version history when um, you're looking at, at several of our providers will keep the version history feature intact, including um, OSF storage and Google Drive um, that both of these are featured in. And you can view or download those previous versions. So this, you know, this presentation were to go through changes for years and years and years, and I keep uploading new versions, um, you'd always be able to come back and see how this project or this presentation has evolved uh, through the version history. The most recent one will be the one that's publicly visible up front, um, but visitors could always come and, and see um, this material. And if I needed to upload a new version, um, I could do that as well. Um, and it would uh, be included in that version history. As long as I keep that uh, title the same, um, it won't just create you know, multiple copies of that same um, presentation but instead will um, become a new version here. Um, so one of the, the elements that David has mentioned as part of um, practice that can help with peer review and sharing when uh, your material, your project is, is private, like this one is, is still private, but I may have a peer reviewer or, or someone that I need uh, to, to look at this for me. Um, if we go back to our contributors uh, page, we have this section for view only links. And so even for a private project, I can create a, a link um, that a visitor would be able to, to use and, and see this material without having to be added as a, as a formal contributor as Nikki and David have here. Um, I can also anonymize that uh, our author contributor list um, with that link so that um, if I need to send this for peer review and it needs to be, you know, uh, have no identities included, um, then that link will satisfy that. So we'll see a list of our view only links here and I'll show you what that looks like quickly. So we have the same data, the same files, same description, uh, but our contributors have been uh, anonymized with our view only link here. Um, and if someone were to, to see this link normally, they would you know, run into um, a page indicating that it's a private project. They can request access if they like, but um, they won't um, see this material unless they have a link like this or add it as a, a contributor. Uh, so one of the real key uh, workflows that, that David um, had discussed was uh, registration, so pre-registering uh, your study before um, getting into data collection and, and um, you know, describing the, the, your methods and hypotheses and, um, and some of that material before you go and do your experiments. Obviously, this, uh, is not, this project here doesn't quite apply, but um, I will show you um, where you get to uh, the point where you can submit a registration. So um, if we're on our 
project page, even one you just started. Um, if you have all the data and you're you're ready to to take a snapshot of this material, um, then uh, the registrations tab here is the place to start that. Uh, in the very near future, you will be able to start a registration um, without having to start a project first, uh, which is very exciting. Uh, but for right now, you will use that uh, registrations tab, start a new registration. And uh, there are multiple um, templates available that vary based on um, the communities that utilize them. And in some cases, funders have uh, requests that these specific templates um, are used and that the questions and fields within these will vary a little bit. Um, and we try to provide some guidance for you if you're not quite sure which one you should use. Um, there's some material here to, to help you think through that. Um, and I'm not gonna complete a draft here, but um, just so that you have an idea what this looks like. Um, it will import material from your project and it will archive the uh, files and other material that is in your project. Um, you'll also have opportunity to do other clarifying, including um, licenses that are separate from your project, if that needs to be the case, um, your subject. And then we see here um, where we're gonna include our uh, design plan, sampling plan, variables, and, and other elements. Um, so I'm not going to submit this and create a registration that uh, doesn't quite uh, belong, uh, but that will give you an idea. And certainly we can uh, share some examples, some good examples of pre-registrations uh, in our follow-up so you can actually see a completed um, registration there. Um, quickly, I'll point out the, the license that David um, mentioned and showed and I think a screenshot here. Um, we have lots of licenses available, including um, the ability to add your own. Um, of course, we'd like to, to make this material as available and shareable as possible. Um, so you can add your own license if needed. Uh, and then finally, the a preprint. And I went ahead and filled out a preprint uh, submission for one of my papers um, so that we won't spend time filling all the metadata out here, but you get an idea uh, where we're submitting our Titles, licenses again, um, information about where our uh, preprint, uh, what subjects or disciplines it may uh, be related to. And uh, now I've got a preprint here on OSF preprints. We have like registries, we have multiple services that, uh, that are community or regional um, oriented that you might submit to. Um, but now I have a, a preprint, a version of my work that I can create a DOI for and share um, uh, with my community for feedback. Um, so that is the, the super fast uh, look at, at the OSF um, and some of those uh, elements that we talked about today. So I'm going to stop and take the last couple of minutes here to see if we have some new questions. Um, Lisa asks, I've read that OSF has or will be implemented data storage limits. Uh, for some researchers, the cap is not sufficient for even a single experiment. Is there a recourse and how does one gain access to local storage provided by OSF institutions? Um, well, I can pick that one up. Um, so yes, next week, actually, um, you will see, you know, you, lots of you have seen these communications already. Um, there will be storage limits for projects that rely on OSF storage. Um, so if you were to, like myself here, were to connect uh, Google Drive or Dropbox or, or one of those services, um, then these caps don't apply to those at all, um, only to uh, files that are included in OSF storage. Um, and those limits apply per uh, project or component. So if I have you know, my experiment, it's going to have lots of one gigabyte, you know, files, perhaps they're audio files or something. Um, instead of putting, you know, dozens of those into my project, I can create new components. And, uh, you know, based on, you know, the sequence that those experiments were done or the individual that managed those experiments, 
Um, and th that storage will be spread across uh, those components um, instead of all accumulating on the project. So those are a couple of quick um, approaches that will help researchers avoid those limits. Um, connecting to local storage is also an option. So for uh, an institution that becomes a, a member of that OSF institution's uh, service, one of the things we can talk about is uh, integrating their local repository or a cloud repository service that they subscribe to um, so that their researchers have another option on top of, of these um, or just helps them satisfy some of these other institutional data sharing requirements. Um, that is an option uh, that we can help with, um, but we would want would want to chat about it. So please do um, write me so we can have a conversation. Um, Diana also has a question, templates for conditions for using and sharing data. I'm not sure if I'm reading that right. I don't know if you can interpret that one, David. Um. Yeah, so I think there are some templates for um, both data management plans and there are templates available for um, uh, sort of informed consent language to show under what conditions data would be shared or not. And some of the old language that we see in old consent forms um, sort of specified in advance why one would be allowed to use data and that is or is not appropriate depending on the conditions. But I think we are just about at time. Um, and so I think I wanna say thank you to everyone for listening and participating. If there are any other questions, um, uh, we'll follow up with some uh, communications and resources and we thank you for your time. Thank you, David. And thank you everybody.